Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. You know, it, it's great that we don't have to drive anywhere in this rain. You know, we can just listen to the webinar <laughs> in the comfort of our home. Uh, but thank you, everybody, for coming this morning, listening in. Uh, we're going to listen to Tom Bronson with Mastery Partners. But before we introduce our speaker, I want to introduce our partner for the Bold Speaker Series, Sean Cass with Texas Security Bank. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me, Andrea? I was having a little technical difficulty. No, you sound good. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited uh, to be here this morning. I'm glad that, that uh, you all have joined us. I'm Sean Cass. I'm Executive Vice President with Texas Security Bank. And very honored to uh, host this business speaker series with the Garland Chamber of Commerce. Um, we have a real treat today uh, with our speaker. Andrea is going to introduce uh, Tom Bronson in just a moment, but I think you guys will be very pleased uh, with the content today. So just excited for you guys to be here. Appreciate the time this morning and uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to host with, uh, with Andrea. So ready to go. All right. Thank you, Sean. I mean, just a reminder to everybody, please use the chat feature if you have any questions uh, for our speaker. He will also ask you from time to time to um, ask questions throughout the presentation. So just keep that in mind and, and have your chat feature ready. All right, so let's introduce our speaker, Tom Bronson. He is a serial entrepreneur, consultant, author, and speaker that has founded, invested in, and been an, exec an executive for scores of companies and has completed over 100 financing and M&A transactions. Tom is currently the founder and president of Mastery Partners, a company that helps business owners maximize business value design exit strategies and transition their business on their terms. Bronson is passionate about helping business owners and has the experience to do it. Tom's most recent book is Maximize Business Value, Begin with the Exit in Mind, came out in January of 2020 and it's available on Amazon. Tom will deliver a roadmap for abandoning old business as usual paradigm and building a culture of innovation. Tom, thank you for being here with us this morning, and we're ready to listen to your presentation. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So happy to be with you, and I am going to share up. Oh, I need to share my screen. Uh, if you can enable me to do that. Yes, sir. Here you go. All right. And here we go. So good morning, everyone. We're going to uh, talk today about uh, creating a culture of innovation uh, in your business. So what do I know about that? Andrea, you were very kind with, uh, with your uh, introduction of me. I am Tom Bronson. I'm president and founder of Mastery Partners. Uh, we are a firm that helps uh, business owners define and execute an exit strategy. Uh, but the lessons that I've learned through a hundred business transactions, uh, buying and selling, buying, building and selling, what you're gonna hear today are the tools that I have used to innovate those businesses so that I could bring massive value to those businesses uh, before I ultimately exited. So uh, let me uh, uh, begin here by defining innovation. So innovation is the process to make changes in something established, especially by introducing new methods, ideas, or products. So by definition, it's a process to make changes. So it requires that you must be willing to change. Now we know how everybody loves to change, right? Everybody uh, appreciates a good change uh, when you've got a plan and a process, uh, changing that process. Well, how do you overcome some of those uh, resistance, uh, the resistances that you might find uh, to change? Uh, change is important. You, you must be willing to change in order to innovate your business. As the great business icon, uh, Jack Welch said, when the rate of external change exceeds the rate of internal change, the end of your business is in sight. So 
you have to be willing to change. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. I've divided the presentation this morning into three different sections. We're gonna start with creativity because if you wanna innovate, you have to start with creativity. Now it's important to understand that creativity and innovation are different things. A lot of times they're used interchangeably, but creativity is thinking up new things, while innovation is doing new things. So in order to innovate, you've got to think up some new ideas and you think up those new things. And then when you start doing them, that is where innovation starts. Innovation, quite simply, is looking at things and thinking about them differently than you think today. It's looking at things from a different angle or seeing things from, from a different perspective. It's about taking a step back and thinking about how you can work on your business. So if you're going to innovate, you have to start by spurring creativity. And here's where we're going to start uh, having a little fun here. Um, I want to uh, ask you, I'm gonna give you an assignment and I'm gonna give you 60 seconds. Let me set my uh, Fitbit uh, timer here. And what I'd like you to do is in the next 60 seconds in the chat box, I want you to describe what you see. Ready? And, whoops, let me get that back. And go. So in the chat box, if you will, put in there what you see. Describe what you see. I'm not sure I can see the chat. Can I see the chat box over here? Let me see. Andrea, I might need your help because I don't see the chat box since I'm presenting now. Yeah. So do you want me to start reading you some off the yeah, start, start, start shouting them out to me. All right, black circle, period, someone winking, um, a black dot, a black dot with the white all around it, black dot in the center of a white screen, um, eyeball, an eye, the center of the universe, <laughs> an eclipse, um, and small black circle in the middle of a large white page. Oh, now it's backwards, white background with a black dot. Ah, interesting. I don't get that very often. So that's, uh, that's time. Uh, don't uh, enter any more. Thank you, uh, Andrea. I'm going to need you again in just a few minutes. So uh, uh, most people are focused on the dot in the middle of the page. But the dot is only a tiny percentage, about 4% of what you see on this white background. Why didn't many people describe the whole picture? Well, it's because we focus on the one thing that draws our attention. The one thing that draws our attention in this exercise is the black dot on the middle of the screen. But we forget that we need to step back and take a broader perspective at what we see in order to understand what might be the influences around that. Let's do another little exercise. Are you ready, uh, Andrea? Uh, everybody recognizes this as Roman numeral nine, right? Uh, and so what I want you to do is uh, you can throw this in the chat. We'll take probably another uh, 60 seconds. Uh, and uh, what I'd like you to do is think about how can you take this Roman numeral nine and turn it into a six with one line. So go. Give you a shorter time on this. People are I can think of two possible correct answers on this. There may be more. Uh, but my mind is limited in its creativity as well. So people have added, <laughs> need more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> need more coffee? Yes. <laughs> some said add an S. Oh, okay. Are there any others? Uh, somebody else said uh, turn it upside down. 
So someone said, turn it like that. That's a Roman numeral 11. Put a horizontal line above it. Put a horizontal line above it. I can't do that. It what will else? then be an upside down six. Uh, well, well, I think you stumbled into the right area there. If you turn it, if you invert the nine, mm -hmm. uh, then you turn it into 11. But if you add a line, then it turns into a Roman numeral six. I didn't say that the line had to be a thin line. I said, just add a line. The line could be a fat line uh, like this one. So that turns it into a six. That's one possible solution. The other possible solution, somebody already shot it out uh, in there, is to add a squiggly line at the beginning and turn it into a six, a Roman numeral nine into a six. So what did we learn from these two short exercises that we had? Well, first of all, I gave you a sense of urgency. I gave you 30 seconds to solve the problem. So, um, so uh, I defined what I wanted you to do, and then I gave you a sense of urgency. Okay, I need you to solve this in the next uh, 60 seconds for the first one and 30 seconds for the second one. And therefore, I don't know, I think we had 65 people uh, registered-ish. Um, then I had 65 different people focused on the mission. Everybody understood what the mission was. We're going we're gonna to describe what we see on the page. We're going to turn this Roman numeral nine into a six. And so everybody was focused for the short amount of time that we had uh, to focus on that. I educated you about what the problem was. I didn't dictate how to solve the problem. I just said, here's the problem. I need you to give me a solution for it. So it's really important not to, uh, when you're trying to innovate something, it's really important not to uh, to define how you're going to solve the problem. Don't dictate how you're going to solve the problem. Simply educate on what the problem is and then let the folks go out and solve it. Because when you do that, then you're giving freedom within the fences, right? You're giving people the opportunity. We've assigned you to the problem. Here's the parameters. Can't go anywhere beyond these things. Uh, and I want to give you freedom. Go out there and solve this problem. And so uh, the other thing, well, of course, that means that uh, we're following the way of the beaver. Everybody knows their spot on the bus. Everybody understands where we're going. Uh, and everybody understands the, what problem we're trying to solve. And they set out to go out and do that. Now, the other interesting thing that we just did kind of in this very micro uh, situation is we ran parallel processes. Um, I, if we have 65 people watching today, we had 65 individuals working on this problem. And so Everybody was attacking it from their own angle, different places, looking at the, the situation from a different place and running parallel processes. Well, when I do this program as a half day seminar, uh, then we actually get our hands, uh, roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty. I hand out uh, uh, the same items, uh, a number of straws and a roll of tape, uh, and, and uh, I give everybody the same assignment and that is to build a contraption that will hold an egg when you drop it from eye level uh, that, so that the egg won't break. And uh, I've given this seminar uh, to the largest group is probably about uh, 200 people. We had um, uh, 20 different groups working on the solution and we were running uh, parallel processes to solve the problem. And interestingly enough, all 20 groups came up with a different solution and all 20 groups solved the problem. Uh, and so it's important sometimes when you're thinking about innovating is to run parallel processes. But we as business leaders, a lot of times throw up roadblocks that might prevent us from being creative or prevent our people from being creative? What are some of those roadblocks? Of course, the old standards. We don't have budget to solve this. We have no money uh, to solve this problem. Oh, we've tried that before or that won't work. How many times do we say that to our people and prevent them 
from being creative. I was given the gift of a wonderful mentor early in my life who uh, I went to work uh, for his business. This is my father, by the way. And my brother and I went to work for their business when we were very young. Uh, and, uh, and we would come up with these harebrained ideas about solving problems. And my father always said the same thing. Huh, that's interesting. Why don't you go try that? He never said, I've tried that before. That won't work. We don't have any money, no budget. Of course, we weren't going to break the bank, right? But we were given the wonderful gift of go out there and try. Now, we didn't solve, you know, 100% of the things we set out to do. But what I learned much later in life from my father was that he said to us, you know, I tried those things that you were trying to do before, long before you guys tried them. And I, and I failed at them. And uh, rather than telling you that I'd tried it before and it didn't work, I'll let you go with it. And I'll be darned if you didn't go out there and solve those problems. Well, that's what we need to do with our people if we want to innovate. Don't, get, don't limit their creativity by telling them we've tried it before or that it won't work. Also, thinking that there's only one right answer to solve every problem. Look, we had, uh, for, the, for the turning the nine into a six, we had two possible solutions. But for the describe what you see on the page exercise, we had multiple solutions. In fact, an unlimited supply of answers to that question. And so sometimes we get caught up in thinking that there's only one way to solve a problem when in reality, there's always different ways that you can solve challenges. Now, one of the things that we do to ourselves that limits our creativity is sometimes we obsess about what others might think. Sometimes we obsess about, oh, this is a stupid answer, or I, I shouldn't say this, or, or um, you know, this is dumb. However, um, if you've ever been in a creative process, you understand that sometimes there's ideas that harebrained as they might seem that uh, that spur other people into thinking differently and suddenly a new solution is created based on something that somebody said that, was, that wouldn't work and obviously wouldn't work. And so as long as you can remove that inhibitor and stop obsessing too much about what other people think and have a free flow of ideas, you never know what idea is going to spur other folks. The other thing that we do kind of to limit our people uh, in terms of their creativity is compartmentalizing our businesses. That's one thing that's a real challenge. You know, in my last business um, that I sold two years ago, um, the, we had a number of different departments. Of course, we had uh, sales and marketing and finance and IT and um, support. Uh, we, were, we, we wrote software, so we had development, we had uh, help desk, those kind of things. Uh, when we were trying to solve challenges, Many times I would pull people from other departments or we would throw it open and say, here's the challenge that we're trying to solve. Who wants to participate? Rather than even if it was a sales problem, if it was a support problem, whatever it was, because many times the solution came from somebody that wasn't intimately involved with it, who was looking at the problem from a different angle. So if you've got a challenge that you need to solve in sales, perhaps you need to invite your finance people to the table, or perhaps you need to invite your product development people to the table. Or if you have a product issue, perhaps you need to invite your sales team or your marketing team or your finance team uh, to the table and break down those silos because people have wonderful ideas. It's about how do we extract those ideas and implement them in our business. So that's, that's how we kind of start with creativity. Because if we want to innovate, we've got to start with creativity. Here in section two, we're going to talk a little bit about the pillars 
of innovation. What are the things that we need to be thinking about now that we've got a creative basis and we've opened our minds and we're starting to think a little differently about the problem? What are the pillars to innovate our businesses? Take a little sip of coffee here. You guys can join me on that. Don't forget, as I started this morning, Creativity and innovation are two different things, right? We started with creativity. Now we're going to move into the pillars of innovation. And so creativity is thinking up new things. We just did a little exercise where we were thinking up new things. By the way, if you want to spur creativity, sometimes you might want to start with a problem that's unrelated to whatever business problem you're trying to solve. In order to get those creative juices flowing, think about something, give them a puzzle to solve, give them some, uh, um, I've got an endless supply of those kind of things. And so if you'd like to have some of those just to spur creativ creativity before you start looking at the problem at hand, let me know and I'll be happy to send you those things. So creativity is thinking up new things innovation is doing new things so so what are the pillars of innovation it starts with identifying the problem now that sounds simple at the outset because we can all agree right if we've got an issue we can all agree what the problem is well not really I think once you identify what the problem is, I think what you need to do, especially with the team that's there to help solve that, is to make sure that we're clear and that we've defined the problem. Why? Because many times we get caught in our own little paradigm about, well, here's the problem I'm trying to solve. Uh, and, and, very, th focusing very myopically on the, the problem that we're trying to solve, when in reality, from a different perspective, it might be caused by these two or three things that are upstream that are flowing down there. And if we're focused myopically on solving this without addressing the things that are upstream, then we're probably, we might be attacking the problem from, uh, a different perspective of what the problem is. So it starts by everybody agreeing, if you're going to innovate, everybody agreeing on the creativity piece, what is the problem that we are trying to solve? Then identify the assumptions about that problem. So what are the assumptions that have caused this challenge, this problem that we have in our business. So, uh, so once we all agree on what the problem is, then we can move into understanding what are the assumptions that have caused this. Then you need to break those assumptions. What do I mean by breaking the assumptions? That means tear down those assumptions, uh, reverse them, think of them in the different direction. Um, uh, take all the assumptions that you have that uh, of the things that have caused the problem and think about how can you reverse engineer them? How would you do these in reverse and figure out perhaps where the problem was caused uh, in the first place? And so once you break those assumptions, then perhaps you have identified some new assumptions and you can develop a new strategy. So in order to innovate, you've got to agree on what the problem is that you're facing. And that doesn't happen all the time. In fact, so many people skip that step of identifying what the problem is and agreeing what the problem is we're solving, that this is why it takes longer and longer and longer to solve problems uh, in business. Once you agree on that problem, identify the assumptions on what caused that problem, break those assumptions, reverse them, uh, think of them in a different direction, and then come up with a new strategy uh, to solving that problem. Now, it's important to note that as you go through this process, there's such a thing in every business as a force field right? The force field uh, is surrounds the status quo. Status quo is how we do things today. That's where the needle resides today, right? Smack in the middle of the page. This is how we're doing it today, and this is where the problem is. On one side of the way we do things today, we've got driving forces for making changes. What are some of those driving forces? 
Some of the driving forces might be uh, customer demand or uh, a, a, um, a sales question. We need to be able to sell this or we've got customers asking for this. Um, we've got perhaps driving forces that we need to fix this problem internally because it's causing us uh, challenges. Uh, those are some of the driving forces uh, that work. But at the same time, we've got restraining forces. What are some of those restraining forces? We've already talked about some of those this morning. Uh, we have no budget to fix this. We have no money to fix this. But more importantly, you might have people that resist change in order to move the needle in the right direction. So when the driving forces and the restraining forces are in equal pressure, the status quo never changes. When the driving forces and the restraining forces have an equal pressure against the problem, you can't solve the problem. So what has to happen? If the driving forces to change the result outweigh the restraining forces, then you can move the needle in the right direction. However, if the restraining forces are bigger than the driving forces, then you perhaps will be moving the needle in the wrong direction. You'll, you'll be moving it in the wrong direction if your restraining forces are bigger. Well, what causes that? As we've already said, people are really resistant to change. They don't like change. They don't like change causes people to move into the valley of despair. How do we get them beyond that? Educate them, help them understand what the challenge is so that we can whoop, get back to driving forces being greater than restraining forces. If you have no budget, you have no money. Well, how do you solve this without investing? in it. Can we solve it given the existing resources that we have? You pull a team together that, in fact, one of my fun little tricks that I always used to, in order to balance the driving forces heavier against the restraining forces is identify the, the folks that are resistant to the change and put them on the team to innovate the challenge then they'll become one of the driving forces once they understand and identify the problem so that we can move that needle in the right direction. Again, if it's all balanced, then you're never going to be able to change. And change, of course, is not necessary because survival is not mandatory. But we've already heard from Jack Welsh that when the forces of change, the external forces of change are greater than the internal forces of change, then the end of our business is in sight. And of course, as W. Uh, Edwards Deming says, it's not necessary to change because survival is not mandatory. Let's, uh, let's ask Blockbuster Video about that question. How would they feel now? Um, so who are some great examples of businesses that have really embraced the pillars of change, that really understand how to agree on the problem, work through the problem, and come up with new assumptions. Uh, how, do, how do they, they know that their driving forces need to be greater than their restraining forces. Everybody recognizes this logo. Tesla, I want a Tesla. I've driven a Tesla. And that's, that's my dream car. Uh, and it's not because it's going to save me money on gas because I, I, don't, I don't really understand all the, the whole energy consumption stuff. But what Elon Musk has done is developed a really cool car that's fun to drive. And so, so Tesla really understands innovation. What are some other companies? We just talked about Blockbuster. Are you aware that uh, in the early 2000s, when Netflix was a brand new company, they attempted to sell themselves to Blockbuster, and I think the asking price was 
seven million dollars seven million dollars and the executives at blockbuster said nobody's ever gonna buy movies and watch movies online huh the last blockbuster closed i think it was just several months ago uh, so netflix understands how to embrace change how to innovate uh, their business who else might we think about salesforce.com uh, many of you probably use Salesforce or, or other CRM. You know, Salesforce did not invent the category of CRM. Um, that, that was invented uh, many, many years earlier. What Salesforce did was figured out how to use the interwebs uh, and, and put that data online so that you can access the data from anywhere you wanted to. Boy, talk about innovation. They literally or figuratively own the market for CRM today. Who else might we think about? Square. Holy cow, that's a big one. That one impacted the business that I was in before. My last company uh, served restaurants, retailers, and wineries. Square figured out that one of the biggest rubs uh, of retailers was the cost of um, using credit cards, accepting credit cards. Look, we've almost become a cashless society, right? Uh, we don't uh, use a lot of cash. We use credit cards for everything. I owned a restaurant uh, back in one of those 100 uh, businesses and a full 87% of our business was credit card transactions. So Square solved that problem by coming up with a uh, one fee, simple, all included, here we go. Uh, and they have been a wildly innovative uh, company. Boy, another one, uh, one of my favorites. Everybody see the, uh, the uh, arrow at the bottom there? That's a smile, right? The Amazon smile, but it's really an arrow pointing from A to Z. I don't think anybody would uh, claim that, that Amazon and Jeff uh, Bezos uh, is not a wildly innovative uh, person. Now, in the cases of some of these, you know, Netflix was losing money and Tesla uh, continues to, to lose money and Amazon in many places lose money. Do you know where Amazon makes their money today? Um, let's open up the chat again. Let's see if anybody knows where Amazon makes their money today. Uh, Andrea, once you uh, get, if anybody knows the answer to that, shout it out to me. Uh, Cause that one's a lot of fun. Uh, anybody giving us an answer on that? Who, Not yet. who knows where Amazon makes money today? Somebody said AWS subscription that, services. That's it. It's the AWS. They make money in their cloud services. Now, what do we know Amazon for today? We know Amazon as an online retailer. They're a category killer. Uh, they're, you know, look, if, if, you know, I, if you're like me, you know, I shop most of my Christmas on Amazon, right? I get stuff delivered to the house, although I can't get toilet paper and, and bacterial wipes right now. Um, and so, uh, but, uh, but everybody thinks of them as that. Where they really make their money is they are a technology business. They are enabling technology uh, for other businesses and they make all their money on their web services, a wildly innovative business and each one of these companies and we could sit here and name dozens more but we could also name dozens of companies that refused to innovate that that may or may not even exist uh, any longer that followed the fate of blockbuster each one of these companies have created a culture of innovation at all levels of the, all levels in the organization. Frankly, one of the easiest things, one of my favorite tools uh, that I use to innovate is what I call creative swiping. Look, pick the companies in your business that have innovated and creatively swipe their ideas. I'm not saying go steal their technology. I'm not saying uh, go out there and, and break any laws, but what are they doing and how are they changing your industry and how can you take those ideas of what they're doing and creatively swipe their ideas and turn them into a new business model for you. That is one of my favorite ways to spur uh, creativity and get us thinking. So now that we understand uh, the 
pillars of innovation. We understand that innovation starts with creativity. Now let's get to the meat of the act, and that is how do we create a culture of innovation uh, in our businesses? Well, look, it all starts with the right hiring process, right? We've got to have the right people on the bus. And um, good to great and built to last, you know, it talks about having the right people on the bus and getting them in the right seats on the bus. In fact, that's been used over and over and over in, in um, different books on management and whatnot. But what does our hiring process look like? Are we hiring people that are going to enable us to be creative, that are going to enable us to, um, to move to the next level? They're going to enable us to be innovative. And I'm talking about every level in the organization. Um, we need to have hiring processes that identify curiosity people who, who are curious about solving things, people who are curious about how this came to be or what are we gonna do the, here or uh, how did we arrive at this? Uh, we need to somehow build into our hiring process, how do we assess creativity? How do we assess, or, I'm sorry, how do we assess curiosity? Uh, we also need to figure out in our hiring processes, how do we hire passionate people. Look, uh, one of my uh, adages that, uh, that I've used for many, many years, and I saw Mark Midford is on here. Mark uh, was a fractional uh, HR guy with us, and, and he would confirm to you that, um, that um, I always, it always boiled down to the same thing for me. For most of our hires in all of our businesses, I was the last interview. Uh, and why was that? Uh, you know, typically if people were applying for a position with us in sales or development or, or you know, engineering, whatever, um, I would be the last interview. They would, might have gone through a battery of interviews with other people who are going to assess their skill set. So when they came to my office and got that final interview, all I was interested in was understanding how curious and how passionate they are because I already know that they have the skill sets. These are the folks that, that have risen through the, the battery of other interviews and have made it all the way to my office. And sometimes I would reject those folks that came in because they weren't curious and they weren't passionate. And my adage is uh, I will take desire over ability all day long. What does that mean? I will take desire over ability. If I've got somebody that is passionate and wants to do it, and, and I, I can assess that they really are going to make a difference versus somebody who is already very skilled at uh, what, what uh, the job entails and they can walk in day one and be um, uh, productive, I will take the passion over the skill all day long. Why? Because I can teach the skills what I can't teach is the passion. So what are you doing in your hiring process in order to assess these things and bring in the right people? I've got a great friend in, um, uh, in Chicago, owns a fairly sizable international uh, business, and he's been having a challenge in one of his departments. And the realization finally was that, well, you know, you keep hiring skilled people, but you're, you're not hiring the right people. How do we find the right people? What do we need to do to turn your interview process on its ear? Attack that we need to innovate our, inner, our hiring process, right? How do we turn that on its ear and go find the right people versus uh, just people who might have the skill set? Uh, and so uh, we're on a path to go and solve that problem. So in order to be innovative, first, you have to start with hiring the right people. The other keys to success are budgeting, uh, encouragement, metrics, questions, and modeling. Let's talk about uh, each one of these. If you genuinely want to have a, an innovative business, then you have to budget for it. 
you have to budget innovation into your process. That doesn't mean, you know, throw um, uh, money into a black hole of, of R&D. It's what, how much do we need to spend in order, how much, I'm sorry, boy, I, I just uh, owe myself a quarter on that. In all of my businesses, we never spent a dollar. We only invested in solving problems. I invested in payroll. I, and in, I invested in the people to go help our customers. I invested in software solutions in order to make our lives easier. I invested in toilet paper so that we didn't have to go down the street to Whataburger and use the bathroom. Every expense that we had at the business was an investment. And so are you willing to invest in innovating your business? It doesn't mean throw money at a black hole. It means what do we really need to invest in order to solve the problems that we have? So it starts with properly, first you hire the right people, and then you properly budget for whatever it is that you're trying to solve. And then you go out and encourage people. You hired the right people. Now you encourage them to go out and solve that problem. You know, we all know that uh, geese fly in a V formation. Uh, and if you've ever noticed, uh, you know, when geese fly over, it's that uh, time of year, I think they've uh, all migrated or migrating back north now. And so we get that rare opportunity to, to see those geese flying over. What are they doing? They're honking. Why are they honking? They're encouraging the lead goose. And why do they need to do that? Because the lead goose is breaking uh, the wind for them in order to make every other goose's job easier. That's why they fly in that V formation. They're all flying in the vortex, if you will, uh, behind the lead goose. And so the other geese are honking in order to encourage the lead goose. And when he gets tired, he drops back and they form a new V. One of the one of the two on his flank takes over a new V, and now he starts honking to encourage that new uh, lead goose. We need to encourage our people to be creative. We need to encourage them to get out and solve the challenges that we have, and we need to measure everything. You know, uh, one of the um, one of my mentors always said, "Look, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. Really, if you don't measure it." It's not a priority. If you say that you want to solve something, it's not that easy. Uh, just as simply saying it, if you really want to solve a challenge, how do you measure it? How do you come up with KPIs, the key performance indicators on the challenge that you're trying to solve so that you can see as you make improvements are they actually improving the outcome? If you don't measure it and you simply make changes, you don't really know whether or not the, you're achieving the outcome that you desire. So if you don't measure it, it's not a priority. You know, uh, I was always guilty. I was guilty many times sitting in the CEO desk of uh, challenging people to go out and solving something. But what I learned later on was that uh, they had a little secret um, handshake, if you will. They knew that if I didn't put metrics in place, I wasn't really that passionate about solving the problem. And therefore, they could, they could uh, go at it at a very uh, esoteric level. Uh, however, if we started by solving a pro started solving a problem by identifying what the metrics are and how do we measure this problem and how do we what are the things that we want to improve, then they knew that I was serious about solving that problem. Hey, you know I, we all have our character flaws, right? Uh, as a CEO, I wanted to solve everything, so you know rapid firing the problems and getting them out there. But they knew that the ones I was passionate about, the ones that I was serious about, I would take the time to identify how we're going to measure those problems and solve those problems so that we can understand what the outcome is. What are you doing to measure the metrics? What is the problem that you're trying to solve? How can you identify three or five or, or two things that, uh, that you can then test and see the changes that you're making? Are they improving the outcome? Because if you don't measure it, it must not be a priority. Now, we started by asking excellent questions. How do, you know, by, by not 
um, uh, again, dictating again what the problem is, but asking excellent questions about what the problem might be. Uh, I've got uh, numerous uh, examples about that. One of them was uh, we were having a real challenge in one of my businesses with our customer uh, support. Uh, our customers were very dissatisfied uh, with the level of support. And uh, it was because it was taking us uh, an inordinate amount of time uh, to uh, to um, get back to their calls. Uh, so one of our executives said, well, the problem is that uh, our customers are calling us and they're not using the online portal uh, to put in a question. If they'd use the online portal, we need to teach them how to use the online portal. We need to teach our customers how to interact with us. But I said, well, what is the problem? Where how do what what problem are we trying to solve from his perspective it was um well it's just an education thing we need to educate our customers how to interact with us but ultimately it was the customers wanted to have their problem solved as quickly as possible and in order to do that then they needed to be able to get us on the phone well how do we get a live body answering the phone and once we started asking the right questions, we started solving the problem and we saw those scores ratcheting up because we were solving problems faster. We had, we installed new technology in order to allow the customers to sit on hold that told them in, you know, so, nice soft tones, how much time that they have to wait or where they are in line. And so, uh, because we didn't have enough people to answer those uh, questions all the time, every time, but we had a very high uh, success rate then once we identified what the challenge was uh, and and what the real rub was with the customers and put a little technology in place, we had a way to measure that and our satisfaction uh, went up uh, significantly. So uh, modeling uh, is another uh, great uh, way to, uh, to um, uh, innovate your business and create a culture. Be willing to make mistakes be willing to fail often. You know, uh, Richard Branson of, um, of um, Virgin Air and, and uh, you know, Virgin Records and, you know, all, he owns dozens and dozens and dozens of businesses. But I would encourage you to go read his book um, and his autobiography uh, and understand how many times he's failed in business. And why is he so wildly successful? Because he's willing to make those mistakes. He's willing to go out on a limb and fail quickly and learn. And if he's passionate enough to redirect and go after solving the problem from a different direction. And so it's okay to perhaps even, as we talked about earlier, to set up parallel processes and let people solve problems from different directions. You can model them both, learn from each one, uh, do an A-B test and see which one is solving the problem quicker, or use the lessons that you learn from both of them if they fail and create a new solution going forward. So don't be afraid to make mistakes. I had a great mentor um, uh, many years ago that uh, said to me, Bronson, if you're not making at least three wrong decisions out of every 10, then you're not making decisions fast enough. So what was his point? He wanted me to solve problems quickly. I wanted to analyze problems. I wanted to find the right answer quickly or find the right answer before we implemented a solution. His message was, look, be willing to fail. Make an attempt. If it doesn't work, back up and try it. You know, just don't put the company in jeopardy, but try to solve the problem, make the decision and move quicker. And that turned us into a very fast moving, rapidly innovative business because he told me that it was okay to fail. It was okay to have 30% of my decisions fail. So uh, once you remove that, uh, then it makes it real easy to, to uh, move forward without the fear of that rejection. Now, if you've got some things that you really want to innovate and you want to think really big about them, it might be important to start small before you bet the bank, right? Uh, start with a smaller solution 
test this, see if it works, and then you can move into a bigger uh, solution. Uh, when, when at my last company, uh, we were the leaders in pulling innovative solutions all together and migrating from an old traditional model of selling software and hardware and hoping for support on the back end to selling all of our solutions as a SaaS based model, software as a service. In fact, we migrated ultimately to selling all of our hardware and software in a monthly uh, easy to digest payment uh, for our uh, customers. We were the first one, we innovated this, but I knew that by selling my hardware on a monthly basis, and I had to make a big investment in that hardware up front, that there was big risk here. And so we started small. I said, look, here's our new model, but we're only gonna take two orders a month and we're gonna see how this goes. Uh, out of the 20 orders that we're, we're taking on a monthly basis, we'll only take two of them this way. Didn't take long to realize that this model was a, was a real stroke of genius and a game changer for us. And then ultimately we migrated selling everything, 100% of our, of our uh, solutions as a SaaS based model. W what happened was our business transformed from having, uh, before we started that, about 5% recurring revenue to when I sold it at 82% of our revenue was recurring revenue. So pay people paying us on a monthly basis. I knew that this was a big idea, but I needed to start this small and put some controls in place to make certain that, that all of our assumptions were right, to make certain that our model worked. So we started small and then we grew it into a giant behemoth uh, that we were ultimately able to sell that business. So uh, we need to provide, uh, you know, we need to provide our people encouragement. We need to give them modeling. We need to give them ways to measure it, but we also need to give them freedom within the fences. We need to give them the opportunity to go out and solve these challenges without us dictating how to solve those problems. Look, uh, one of my favorite uh, things to say is that it, it, when I'm the CEO of any business and I've been the CEO of, of dozens of businesses, my first objective when I get out of bed in the morning is to make certain that I'm still the dumbest guy in the room. I don't want to hire anybody dumber than me. And that would be a real hard challenge. Uh, and so, uh, so I wanted to always hire people way smarter than I was and if I'm hiring people that are way smarter than I am and they're very passionate about what they're doing, why am I telling them what to do, right? I need to give them freedom. Let's define here is the field that we're playing on and now go out there and solve it. I hired you to do excellent work. Go out there and do excellent work. Rein them in when it's time, right? If they, if they jump the fence and they start running down to the river, uh, then perhaps you need to rein them in, but define the fences define the playing field, and then let them go out and play. If you've hired excellent people, let them go out and do their job. You'll be amazed at the result. Steve Jobs, you know, one of the um, most amazing innovative minds uh, on the planet. Steve was a business guy. He wasn't a technologist. He was a business guy. He said that innovation distinguishes between a leader uh, and a follower. He wasn't out there making the products. He had really smart people behind him making the products, but he was clearly uh, an innovator. So now that we understand that innovation starts with creativity, uh, that uh, we understand the pillars of innovation and we understand how to create a culture of innovation, what are the things that we can innovate in our business. If you're a product company, if you're selling products or if you're manufacturing products, uh, then certainly you can innovate your products um, and you can use this process to do that. Um, if you, uh, any business has processes, processes to get things done. Have you documented your processes? Are your processes things that you use to train new people? Uh, well, are, can they be innovated? Absolutely, uh, they can be innovated. Every process uh, can be innovated. What else can you innovate in your business? Frankly, everything. 
everything is open to innovation. And when you as a business leader, when we as business leaders start thinking from that framework, that everything in our business can be innovated, then we can make a huge difference uh, in our business and we can really spur that creativity and interject uh, the, the pillars of innovation and innovate everything in our business. Because uh, you're either in a business that has been disrupted or you are in a business that will be disrupted why not be the disruptor and think about innovating everything uh, in your business? I'll end with uh, uh, one of the greatest hockey players of all time, Wayne uh, Gretzky. He said, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where the puck has been. And that's what made him great. So if we as business leaders can start thinking about where the puck is going to be, and we're rushing to where the puck is going to be and not where the puck is today, then we can create a culture of innovation. So uh, that is how you create a culture of innovation. Uh, I wanna open it up and give you an opportunity to ask me anything. AMA, not, uh, this isn't Q&A, this is AMA, ask me anything. Uh, I always had a process in our business where you could ask me anything and I would, if I know the answer, I will answer uh, the question. Um, and um, uh, you can ask me about my trip to um, Alaska last week. You can ask me about taking a COVID test and uh, you can ask me about innovating your business. If you want to have a dialogue with me, then you can connect with me at Tom at masterypartners.com or www.masterypartners.com. I'm easy to find. Uh, yes, that uh, cartoon is my actual face. Uh, and so uh, what questions do we have, Andrea? Uh, let's see. Well, people are just thanking you so far for a great presentation. No questions yet. And also a reminder for everybody, we are recording this presentation and you will be receiving a link for this for your reference. So you just wait for another email from me later today with the recording. Boy, I did such a great job covering this that nobody has any, everybody's now set and ready to rush out of here and go and innovate. Look, Here's the thing that I always say and when I, when I give a talk on this or, or one of the other things, many things that I uh, do keynote addresses on, I speak at a lot of conferences. I challenge you to take one thing that you've learned today, one thing, and go and implement that in your business. What is the one nugget that you found out of today's uh, program? that you can go out and change the way you're doing things in your business, that you can introduce uh, some innovation into your business. Because otherwise, then you spent an hour and how much ever time with us here today, hour and 15 minutes or whatever it is, uh, and, and didn't uh, really do anything other than have a cup of coffee with somebody who made a presentation. What are you going to do in your business? I challenge you to uh, figure that out. If you can pick two or three things, even better. And if you want to feel what it feels like to be held accountable, then uh, email me those two or three things and I will be happy to hold you accountable uh, to them. Uh, we do that with our clients all the time. And so uh, I would be happy to uh, help hold you. Anything come in there, Andrea? Well, we, have, we have one question. Uh, okay, now we have two. Um, so it says, Tom, in the context of starting new venture as a side hustle, what are the key components you focus on considering the limits of time and capital? Read that again the, in, the, in, in the context of starting a side hustle? Yes. What are the key components you focus on considering the limits of time and capital? So, of course, capital is, is a limit. Um, 
and uh, unfortunately, we all don't have access to the same level of capital, right? I mean, if I had access to uh, more capital, I would have done more things, right? Uh, but we're all gifted with the same amount of time. The reality is, is that uh, most of us don't use that time as wisely as we possibly can. Um, how are you using that extra time? If you really want to uh, begin with a, with a side hustle, um, and that means uh, for those of you um, who uh, don't know that term, that's you have a full-time job and you want to do something on the side that generates additional income. Well, how are you using that time? Are, are, you, are you taking your nights and weekends? Are you, are you really focused on doing that? You know, frankly, innovation in a business is almost a side hustle, right? Our business is to go out and serve our customers and generate revenue and do all that. But if we're going to step back to innovate our business, it really is almost a side hustle because it's ancillary to the things that we're currently doing today. So how do we figure out how to get more time? I, I argue that if you really are passionate about pursuing something, uh, no matter how busy you are, you will find the time to go do it. But if you're not finding that time, uh, then perhaps you're not as passionate about doing it as you thought you were. I've done plenty of uh, multiples of businesses at the same time. Uh, and, um, and frankly, there's, for anything I wanna do, I always find the time to make it work, but I've got to be passionate and, and really want to get it done. I don't let um, sleep or, or entertainment get in the way. You know, I typically get, my Fitbit tells me I get about five and a half hours of sleep a night, maybe six. Uh, I am, you know, in bed relatively early. I am up at five every morning. Why? Because then I've got my creative time between five and 8 a.m., uh, I can go uh, running, get my energy up, I can uh, uh, focus, uh, and I can get a lot of work done before the phone starts ringing at eight o'clock in the morning. And so that's my time to think about and innovate and make changes in my business. What are you doing to create that time? That's really uh, the way I think about it is, is find the extra time to go do it. Uh, Tony Robbins calls it uh, net time, no extra time. What, it, what is it right now that you can do uh, to learn new things? When I drive in a car, uh, I have my cell phone on, I've got my Audible, I am learning new things. So that, it, that means that I don't have to sit here and read all of these books that I have sitting on my desk that are lined up for me to read. I can listen to them and read them uh, as I drive. So how can you do that? Find the extra time. If you're really passionate, you'll find the time. If you're not passionate, then, then don't beat yourself up. Let it go uh, and, and move on. So what else do we have, Andrea? Uh, so I know you mentioned, you know, what piece of this presentation are you going to take forward and, and use in your business? People mentioned um, the, the fence, uh, freedom within the fences. Um, and they also mentioned, you know, the focus more on the, the difference of focus more on finding a solution versus the focusing on the problem, which is something that you mentioned as well. Um, the other have is more on the personal side. What part of Alaska did you visit? Um, oh. <laughs> Zach went to uh, Kenai, I think that's how you would say it, uh, last summer, and he said it was amazing, so he's just wondering where you went. <laughs> I, uh, I flew into Fairbanks, which is way farther north than you might realize. It's a four-hour flight to get from here to Seattle and another four-hour flight to get to Fairbanks, which is dead center of the state, basically. Uh, then we drove down to Denali for uh, for. Uh, just a day trip to see the highest peak in North America, 20,300 uh, feet. It's spectacular. Uh, but then we went north into the Arctic Circle so that I could experience 24-hour uh, daylight. Um, it is a very surreal experience when you're in a town called Coldfoot. And when I say town, uh, I use that term very loosely. There are people who live there uh, and there's a truck stop. Uh, and, uh, but when you're in a town like Coldfoot and you wake up at two o'clock in the morning and it is full daylight, brighter than it is right now with the clouds that we have, that is a surreal experience. Uh, and uh, to go up into the North Slope and stand in the tundra, man, it was just a, a fabulous, fabulous time. In fact, my, uh, my uh, blog post and my podcast podcast, not next Monday, but the following Monday are going to be business lessons that I learned 
driving the Dalton Highway into uh, the north of Alaska. I'm very excited to to share that. So follow me on uh, on our uh, website, and you can you'll be able to read more about that. What else, Andrea? Well, that's all we have uh, in the chat section. Um, well, everybody, you can see that his email is on the screen right now, Tom at masterypartners.com. If you have any more questions, you can feel free to reach out to him. And like I said, the presentation will be available to you later this afternoon uh, to reference. Um, so, I mean, this is Tom. I think this is the end of our presentation today. Thank you so much. Um, I just have a few other, um, few little details to, to talk to everybody about. Um, again, I'm going to thank our, our, our partners for today, Sean Cass and Texas Security Bank. Thank you for, for partnering with us and, and creating the Bold Speaker Series 2.0. And like I said, a few reminders, we have our Spark on the Go event on next Monday, June 29th at 1130. Tom Sullivan is with the U.S. Chamber. He's Vice President of Small Business Policy, and he will talk to us about the road for recovery for small businesses. Also, our 36th annual golf tournament is on September 18th. For more information, please visit our website, website garlandchamber.com. So this concludes our event. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone.